Wintersheim. For our viewers, tell us please a little bit about yourself. What do you do and how are you connected with McKenzie and Company? Um, I teach uh, at New York University um, and I coach two to three individuals uh, that are in leadership roles. Uh, my connection with McKinsey is, as an alum, uh, it's part of who I am, and I actively work with other alum uh, on different projects at different moments in time. As I know, you knew Marvin Bauer personally. I did. Could you please share how did you meet Mr. Bauer, how it was? Uh, I would love to. Um, Marvin Bauer and my father were working on a project together for General Motors. Um, it was in the early 60s and General Motors was establishing General Motors Institute to facilitate helping um, minority populations rise in the ranks of management. And uh, my father was Dean of Science at Purdue University and knew the academic world and Marvin really understood the business world. So together they were working with General Motors and um, one weekend Marvin and his wife Helen came and stayed with us at our house. And uh, it had as large an impact on me as any weekend in my life. Um, my parents were both academics and I really believed I was gonna grow up and be an academic. But I loved, um, loved manufacturing, loved plants, loved business, but I was gonna be an academic. Um, and when I met Marvin and saw the respect my father had for Marvin and the respect Marvin had for my father, I knew I was gonna be a consultant and I was gonna to touch the business world, which I have done for most of my life. Could you please share about your book, Mackenzie's Marvin Bauer? What is it about? And what has inspired you to write this book? Um, after I left McKinsey, I started my own consulting firm uh, and sold it in the year 2000. And Marvin was very much part of how I set my firm up and who I was. And I had always, there were always stories about Marvin floating around the firm. Everybody was influenced by him. He helped everybody stand taller, be better. And uh, I thought it was, uh, I've always wanted to collect those stories one place. And when I sold my firm, I could not consult for a year. And it was the moment to go down and work with Marvin on collecting those stories. But very rapidly, it became more than those stories. It became his story. A couple of the stories that um, I think help me understand who he is and the impact and how important values are, um, if I might, when he, uh, He took, a, he took a journey to get to the uh, law firm Jones Day, and when he was there, the depression hit, and he was the only lawyer that had an MBA. So he, he was put on creditor committees of, I don't know, a dozen companies, big companies. And as he sat on those creditor committees, he basically said these companies didn't go bankrupt because the CEO made bad decisions or because the CEO was dumb. These companies went bankrupt because people on the front line didn't share what they knew with the CEO. Um, and it happened at TRW and it happened at every place. It was the same story. And he really believed there was a need to facilitate information flowing in organizations professionally. Uh, so take to take what he understood and learned at Jones Day about what a professional firm was and bring it to the world of management and leadership. And then when he met James McKinsey, it was the right place for him to join. It was the right place for him to go and the right firm for him to be part of and define and create. And he did. Um, and he never wavered from those principles. Um, when he was elected to the Business Hall of Fame, he said, he got up on stage uh, and said, this is a mistake, I'm not a businessman, I'm a professional. Um, 
he was totally driven by doing the right thing, not by knowing it, but by doing it. Um, he never stopped learning. He wanted to understand. And he also wanted to help others do the right thing. And, and there, there are many, many stories about that. You said very interesting thing that um, Mr. Bauer tried to uh, make people to think what is right and do the right thing. Tell me, please, because it's not so easy in our days to understand what is right and what is wrong. How did he explain what is right? I think he did. A, there are a couple of things that he would do. And, there, and he, one time he said to me, there's not a right and a wrong. There's a writer. There's a better. And you go and you learn. I think that he, he you know, didn't act instantaneously. There's, he said there's few decisions that aren't, that couldn't use a night's sleep over. Think about it. Reflect on it. Uh, he really believed that being an outsider and being an objective outsider made a difference in the consulting field because you could ask the questions that people might have assumed to be so. You could challenge that and that facilitated getting the right thing. It's about um, helping people. Um, it's about understanding the interrelationship between business and society. Business is part of the economic engine we need, but it's more than the economics. It's the lives of many people. Um, In, in many ways, anyone that Marvin touched stood taller and asked more questions, aspired to be a better person after he touched them. We know that the majority of people are familiar with such a phenomenon as Harvard Business School, and most businessmen know who Marvin Bauer is. In your opinion, how did Harvard influence Marvin Bauer? and how Marvin Bauer influenced Harvard. You know, they both rose at the same time in many ways. So it's hard to really say what did what here, but the reality is part of Marvin's belief in high quality and high standards came from his life at Harvard and his life at Jones Day and his life, and, and his life with his father. Um, and he went, you know, he, when he started Harvard Business School, he, he was a graduate of Harvard Law School and wanted a job at Jones Day and didn't get it. So he went to Harvard Business School. And the dean at the law school said, that's the stupidest thing you could do. Business people are no good. Why are you going to business school? But he had a respect for business. And I think that his respect for business, I think McKinsey's hiring of people from Harvard, um, which they did for the first time in 1953. Um, they brought, you know, consulting before then was experts. I'd get the guy that ran sales and knew how to run sales to help me on a sales problem. And Marvin said, no, what you want is smart young people that will ask questions. Um, and he was right. Um, and it was, it, it, it defined what the industry was. So he, um, he elevated what a Harvard student could do. Um, McKinsey became the aspiration for Harvard students. And also he really respected Harvard and it was part of who he was. Um, from as early as I can remember him being involved with Harvard, going there, he spoke with the deans frequently, the deans that shaped the schools. Uh, John MacArthur, um, recalled that when he was trying to, John MacArthur was the dean um, in, of the business school who said, you know, my job is like investing in intellectual capital. I have to pick the people I'm investing in. And um, Clayton Christensen and Michael Porter were people John MacArthur invested in, but talked about with Marvin. Did Marvin influence? I don't know. Did Harvard influence McKinsey? Of course. A large part of McKinsey is Harvard. How do you perceive Marvin Bauer as a consultant, 
mentor, businessman, innovator, or any other? You know, when I read that question, I began to ask myself, you know, what would Marvin want me to say? Um, and I often ask myself, what would Marvin do? And um, I think Marvin really cared about people becoming the leader they want to be. Uh, his first book, The Will to Manage, he said, I wish I had called it The Will to Lead. And then he wrote The Will to Lead. It's about not just wanting to, but being it. Um, and I think it's really important today for every walk of life. It's about leadership. Um, being a leader, no matter what the circumstance, what you say and what you do are what counts. Um, and you can't be a good consultant if you don't care about the client. Um, it's about wanting to do the right thing. It's about wanting to help people. Um, that's who Marvin was. Uh, could I ask you, please, uh, how do you personally perceive Marvin Bauer? Because from your words, I understand that it can be a mentor. Do you perceive Marvin Bauer for you as a mentor? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when I was at McKinsey, I, I told you when I first met him when I was eight, but when I was at McKinsey, my first assignment was an assignment where he had a relationship with the client. Um, and um, it helped me be more inspired to do the best work I could every single day and to ask the question what was right. Um, and when he came one day and saw how kind of friendly I was with the client, he said, you need to move to a new client. You're not an outsider anymore. And it was so true. But the fact that he cared enough to tell me that meant that he also believed in me um, and helped me believe in myself. What do you think was the specificity, uniqueness of Mackenzie in the form uh, that Marvin Bauer created? Well, I think that um, its history is a little bit unique. Um, I'm not there right now. But, but the fact that they really, you know, adopt to these, the responsibilities of the clients ahead of the potential, being independent, telling the truth, knowing stuff about management, um, the values that are in place that, that they live are very much, um, Marvin and, um, There is no other place that's Marvin. There are other places that do great work. A number of researchers have compared McKinsey with Jesuit order. Could you please comment this? You know, I don't know enough about Jesuit order. Um, McKinsey is a place that is very disciplined. Um, that is really about building the individuals that are working there and helping them grow. Um, you know, when, when I was there, uh, when you went to a training program, the ITP, the introductory training program, Marvin came to everyone and met with you individually. And then he would take scones home to his wife, Helen. Um, you know, it, it's about caring. Um, I don't, I don't believe it is your whole life as I perceive that the Jesuit community is, but I'm, I, I don't know. To understand and compare how Bauer was brought up and how students are brought up today, how do you think what has changed in teaching over the past 70 years? Well, the world has changed in many, many ways. And um, you know, from the you know, fact that he, his house was one of the first houses with electricity on his street. Um, but it's still about um, human beings. Uh, it's about integrity. It's about um, making the world better. It is different, um, but many of the underlying issues are the same. I think that, you know, when Marvin was brought up, his father really 
spent a fair amount of time helping him uh, learn to make decisions and to respect other people. Uh, Marvin remembered when he was eight years old, his family was thinking to, about moving to a different part of town. And his father brought in Marvin and his brother William and said, what do you boys think? And Marvin doesn't remember what he said, but the fact that his father asked him made a huge difference uh, in how he approached everything. Um, and when he was at Brown, his uh, paper that kind of got him some fame was about um, what people say versus what they think and mean. And um, Marvin was always about understanding what really needed to be done, what people really needed. And um, one thing that is different that I do want to mention, I think that when Marvin went to school, there was more emphasis on general management and less on splitting the pieces apart. Um, and, and that's a little bit of a challenge. Dr. Edersheim, how would you characterize the relationship between McKenzie and Harvard Business School? Are they partners, like-minded structures? Or maybe it is some kind of the one structure that divided onto theory and practice. How do you think? You know, I don't know exactly what the relationship is today, but I think that there are institutions that truly respect each other and are codependent. Um, Marvin was always curious what he could learn, what the leading thinkers were doing, what they were thinking about. Um, I think he'd love to sit down with Amy Edmondson today and understand what she's doing on uh, the psychology of safety. Um, and, you know, and I think Harvard very much respects McKinsey. So they're, they're, they're codependent. They uh, both care about creating management that will make the world a better place. They both care about attracting leaders and building leaders. In your opinion, what has changed in the nature of the relationship between McKenzie and Harvard Business School over 70 years? Well, they've both grown bigger and more independent and stronger. Um, and, you know, and in some ways they, they compete on, you know, who's going to come up with the best idea first. But um, I, I think it's a very healthy relationship. Dr. Edersheim, um, there are many very famous and rich people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, but most of the experts with whom we spoke from the post-Soviet space in USA and Europe, they agree that all these people can be capitalists and very rich people, but at the same time, uh, they are not equal to the genius of Marin Bauer who actually manages to create something that didn't exist before. And besides, he gave birth and the way to life to the whole constellation of people whom we know perfectly well. In your opinion, why there are no people like Marvin Bauer today? I actually believe um, there are many people like Marvin Bauer. I think if Marvin Bauer were here, he wouldn't want us to know his name in front. Marvin Bauer cared and worked behind the scenes. I think there are a number of people that are doing that. Um, I also think that um, there are people that, um, you know, I don't know what Marvin would be if he was born today, um, but I do know he would care about leadership. Wendy Kopp builds leaders, attracts leaders in Teach for America. Charles Best is behind the scenes serving. Um, Sachin Mandela at Microsoft helps people stand up and be their best and serve more. I mean, Bill Gates has grown in his role about serving. He's still Bill Gates, but he's grown. Um, I think that, you know, you can be Marvin now. Dr. Edersheim, there is not so many people who knew Marvin Bauer personally as you do. And uh, maybe you can share some stories from your life uh, about Marvin Bauer, about some lessons that he gave to his colleagues or some other stories. Let's see if I can, you can, I can show you this picture of Marvin as a kid. Let's hold it straight for you. This is, this is Marvin in high school. I have many stories. 
Let me just give you a couple. Um, and, and if I think about it, I may, I may have a third. But the first one, when I, when I was starting my consulting firm, it was really about the operation side, anything from designing to delivering a product. And um, I, I, I had lunch with Marvin and I said, I think what I'd like to do is guarantee my work by saying, saying to people, I'm not gonna charge you, but I'm gonna charge you a fraction of what we save. And he looked at me and he said, people could question the decisions being made if that's how they were paying you. And you might cut a corner to save a dime. I know you wouldn't do it, but people might question it. Don't set yourself up to be questioned. And that's something that you know I remember almost every day of my life. Oftentimes we do things that aren't wrong, but set ourselves up to be questioned. Um, and, and it created a consciousness in me um, that was of a different, um, different sort. Uh, the second story was when the firm was um, working at General Motors in probably 1985, 86. Um, Marvin came to the opinion that, that the leadership at General Motors what, didn't want our help, they just wanted our imprint and that we should, and that we should leave. And um, it, was a, it was really a controversial decision because it was a lot of revenue and a lot of people really believed that what they were doing was right and was helping them. Um, but Mar Marvin felt we shouldn't be at a place where the leadership wasn't capable of taking the advice and doing something with it. That's why he refused to work for Howard Hughes. Um, and, uh, well, and when he was at, uh, he was at um, General Motors, he saw Mary Barra in a meeting and, you know, he said, sh sh we need to be listening to her. But the management wasn't at the time. Those were a couple of stories. Um, he fired somebody that had a lot of talent that everybody thought was the most talented person in the world because they didn't adhere to firm values was more important to build a culture that cared about doing the right stuff and adhered to the values than it was to have the smartest person in the world in the firm. That was a, a painful thing to watch, but it had a huge impact on a large number of people. Even the person that got fired said it was the right thing to do and it changed me too. Thank you very much for these uh, stories. Uh, could you please also share about the values of McKinsey and Company and of course of Marvin Bauer? One of the interesting things about the values, even, you know, even when I was working with him on the book in 2001, he basically said, you know, they, they were at McKinsey working on rewriting the values. And I said to him, how can you let them rewrite your values? And he said, because they have to be their values. And if they don't rewrite them, they won't be their values. They won't be living them. I don't want values on a wall that people look at and walk by. I want values people live. Um, putting the client ahead of the firm, that's, that's a huge value. Um, another value is, is, I don't know the exact words, but um, it's about believing in your coworkers. So, for example, they have a policy about you spend your money like the client's money, and I trust you to do that. And I said, well, why don't we just say, you know, you can spend $25 on meals. And, and Marvin said to me, because if we say that, everybody will be spending their time figuring out how they can cheat that rule. But if we tell them that we trust them, they'll spend less. We want them to be focused on being the best people they can not fighting rules. And that was what, th those are the values of McKinsey. The humanness of Marvin. Here's another interesting Marvin story. Um, I, was, um, I was at a training program in Europe that he was at, and I, I think it was, I'm not positive, but I think it was the Amsterdam Euro airport. And I was, I was online, to, and then he came in, and the line was pretty long, and I said, oh, Marvin, come here and join me in line. And he looked at me and he said, 
there's no reason to cut in line. I don't need to. Um, and it was, it made me feel like, what was I doing inviting him to cut in line? And it's, it's how he treated other people all the time. Um, it, it's what him, it's what led him when he was done and retiring, sell his shares back to his partners so the firm could keep on going without being focused on, you know, figuring out how to make enough money.